joining us. This is Christy Casey Sandy. This <laughs> Good morning. It is really early on the East Coast. This is Christy Casey Sanders coming to you live from Atlanta. Uh, today we're going to be speaking with Johnny Moore of Creative Facilitation. And we're going to be talking about how to make meetings more productive, more creative, uh, and what meeting planners are doing unintentionally that might be causing some of the dysfunction in meetings. So uh, welcome, Johnny. Uh, Hi, Christy. Can, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about how you became a meeting facilitator? Uh, sure, yeah. I, I used to work in advertising and marketing, so I had a lot of experience of going to meetings um, and running meetings. I've done a lot of focus groups. And what I noticed as I progressed in that um, career was I started to get get more interested in, um, oh, Christy, I'm getting an echo. Oh. Oh, I know why. There oh, was a slight technical have... glitch in my story, and that's entirely my own fault. <laughs> that's OK. There's a meeting planners about sorting out your technology. <laughs> So where was I? So I worked in in advertising. I'd go to a lot of meetings, and I got more and more interested in in the outcomes of these meetings, and and started to notice how many of these meetings weren't really very creative, and I suppose the creative version or or or, or productive. Um, and I remember a friend of mine who went to a regular monthly meeting that I also went to, admitting afterwards that although above the surface of the table he looked the picture of composure. Inside his stomach, he said he was tying himself up in knots in frustration at the things that were not happening in this meeting. Uh, so I gradually got more and more interested in the processes of meetings, um, and, you know, and studied um, a lot of different approaches, uh, psychology, psychotherapeutic approaches to meetings and how they run, and just got really fascinated in, in ways to make meetings more engaging for the participants, more creative, more productive, better able to draw out subjects that would otherwise go unspoken. Um, and I guess about 15 years ago, I started to st stop saying that I was an advertising man and started saying I'm a, I'm, I'm a facilitator. That's really an interesting progression. Um, I want to get more into some of the things that you saw as being the dysfunctions and what meetings are missing, uh, but I want to take a moment first and just welcome our virtual audience as well. Uh, I saw that Kiki Latalian was uh, testing out her question power. Um, so for those of you who are watching virtually and watching live, we'll be broadcasting until 9.30. Uh, so if you have any questions for Johnny, if you have any comments, if you have any thoughts that you'd like to add to the conversation, the way that you do that is you tag your tweets with yay PYM. You'll see that underneath my name uh, along with my Twitter handle and Johnny's Twitter handle is on his badge as well. So that's one way that you can be communicating with us. Uh, you can also post comments on the YouTube video comment stream itself. So feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, if you're watching this on demand, we will be also moderating questions and answering those as those come in. Um, so that being said, um, Johnny, tell me a little bit about what was causing the dysfunction at these meetings and what you felt was missing. Um. I think there are all sorts of factors at work that stop meetings from, from being effective, often um, to do with the culture of the organization, um, a lot of the time to do with the hierarchy within the organization. It's, it's, it's actually quite difficult for people to talk, to talk truth to power. Um, and, and often the formats that we settle for our meetings, if I had to think of one really single cause for why meetings are terrible, it's probably school. I think, I think that most of us have went to school at a time when the format was, the lesson was of fixed duration, you mostly sat still and listened to the expert talking from the front, and of a lot of our meetings are still organized that one way. Uh, one person gets to talk, everybody else has to listen. Um, we pretend that we're being very attentive in meetings that might last half an hour, an hour, two hours long. Um, but we're not really biologically wired to sit like that for long periods of time. You know, most of our biological history was walking the savannah and being very active and moving a lot. But we've got it into our heads, I think because of school, that an effective meeting is mostly sitting down, mostly listening, and nodding our heads as if, as if we're present when we're not. Um, if we actually pay attention to kind of our biological origins, we realize that meetings need to be much more physically active than that and place less of a strain on, on, if you like, the prefrontal cortex, the thinking, rational part of our brain. Um, I think that part of our brain is good for maybe 15 or 20 minutes concentrated activity, after which it pretends that it's still working, but really it isn't, and we're just getting horribly distracted. 
So I think we need to forget what we learned in school uh, and come back to to some more sort of fundamental ways of meeting as human beings and, and stop kidding ourselves that these old-fashioned ways are really effective. So how can meeting and event designers reformat their meetings so that they are more productive and they are more creative? Um, I would say that one of the most important things to, to focus on is to move away from what, what I would call a one-to-many format, that schoolroom format, towards what I would call a many-to-many. -many. Um, there's a blog post I wrote, and we might put a link to it up at some point, that the Rand Corporation put together in the 60s in which they drew pictures of three different kinds of networks. Uh, they were talking about energy networks, but I think the model applies to networks of all kinds, and meetings have the potential to be networks. And on the left-hand side, they talked about a one-to-many system, where in a meeting, one person talks and everybody else just gets to listen, which actually isn't very satisfying. You have a, a mid middle sort of model, which is called the distributed model, or hub and spoke, where you might break people into smaller conversations, but generally speaking, one person is supposed to be in charge of that breakout conversation to chair it. That's a, a, a hub and spoke or distributed model. And then there's a much more distributed model where you don't have one person or a small number of people who are coordinating the conversations in the meeting. People are actually free to move about the room and create conversations of their own. So it's actually what people naturally do during coffee breaks. And it's interesting that in many of the meetings we go to, the coffee breaks have a massive energy level, a level of energy and excitement that's missing from the conventional part of the meeting. And I think we need to move meetings to that more conversational format. Now, the pitfall is you don't know what's going on in those conversations. You're not much less in control of the content than you feel you are if one person is presenting from the PowerPoint. So you do lose control and you do perhaps risk people saying, oh, but that's just a mess, that's just chaos. I would say that that's a network, a distributed network, that's a more robust network, and it's highly likely you get a greater level of engagement because you've given a great deal more autonomy to the participants to organize themselves physically and emotionally uh, to talk to the people they're interested in about the things that they're interested in. So I, I think there has to be a sort of shift in mentality from, from the controlled one-to-many to a less controlled and more conversational approach. Um, in a distributed model, do you actually have any techniques or um, suggestions for meeting planners in terms of helping the audience create the content or capture those conversations, or do you find that that's intrusive? There's, there's, there are a lot of uh, fairly simple formats for, for creating a, a, a more conversational conference. Um, for example, there's Open Space, which is fairly well established, it's been going 30 years now. That, that's a format that means that anybody in the audience can propose a topic for a breakout conversation. Uh, they put that up on a, on a wall so everyone can see it, and then they pick up space in the room and occupy that space, and they're free to host the conversation there with anybody else in the room who thinks that's a good topic to be talking about. Um, I could give a more elaborate explanation than that, but open space is essentially, uh, it's like a slightly well-organized coffee break. It's a coffee break with additional signaling for what we're talking about. In a regular coffee break, you don't know what people are talking about, but you use your sort of native wit to join conversations where you think people might be interesting. In open space, you have some information about what people will be talking about. So that's one format, a conversational format, that lends itself to, to actually allows an audience in a relatively short space of time to create a series of these conversations. And there are other approaches like um, World Cafe is another very simple conversational uh, format. So I, I think if someone just Googled conversational meeting formats or unconferences, you'd very quickly discover there are quite a few quite well established and simple ways to get the meeting to be more distributed. Um, so th there, there are those ways of doing it. Yeah, I remember uh, there was a roundtable we held in San Francisco not too long ago, and um, there was a, a corporate planner um, who works with a very high-end technology company, and she was very excited not so much about open space the way it first launched, but what she calls open space 2.0. So that might be something uh, worth kind of exploring more in like a planner meetings article later about what the differences are, because I, I do believe that open space is now starting to evolve into a more corporate friendly um, uh, format that people would have a, an easier way introducing to key stakeholders. Because I think that is a challenge when um, meeting planners are trying to think outside the box and do things that deviate from the status quo is actually saying, 
uh, okay, we're going to do away with the 60-minute sessions and the Q&A at the end, and we're going to be doing this, that, and whatever. Do you have suggestions um, on where meeting planners can either find, you know, statistics or research to back up these proposals or just general um, advice for them when they're talking to people who are very resistant to change and, and, and want to stay with that one-to-many format? Mm. Um, I, I think there's sort of two parts to that. Yes, there is research uh, available so that you could, if you wanted to have a purely rational argument with people, it's really quite solid research to show why a one-to-many format is not effective. I, I tweeted a piece just the other day by an academic at Oxford Brookes University the chapter and verse on why lectures are not a very effective learning format. Lectures are essentially the origins of most one-to-many formats. I think a lot of the time it's not really about what the research shows. I mean, I, I, that's not what most human resistance is about. That's just discomfort with the unknown, um, which it's easy to mock, but it's perfectly understandable. I, I don't want to get too far outside my comfort zone. If you asked me to do an Irish dance, I would give you a lot of resistance. You could present any number of arguments about, about the benefits to me. I would be hiding in a corner of the room. Uh, unless you created it in a way that was respectful of where I'm coming from, and gave me some, some element of control. So I think my advice would be, if you really want to do a more innovative format, you've, you've, got to take, you've got to stick your neck out a bit and take some risks and negotiate with people about what, what risks you take. So where I've experienced some success is I've worked with organizations where we've take, gone to a conventional conference, left the format largely unchallenged, but put in two hours of open space somewhere in the middle of it, which means that we have one or two rounds of open space. And that gives everyone a little taste of it. It doesn't feel like an enormous risk because it's not using the whole conference time to do it. Uh, and generally that, that goes over well. People go, okay, that worked quite well. Maybe we could, we could do a bit more of that. So I, I always feel there's always a volume control. Um, what I think you need to avoid doing is going, oh, well, people around here can't stand innovation, so we'll leave things exactly as they are. I mean, I think you just need to all change in the end comes from someone taking some element of, of personal risk. Just just choose what risk you take and, and recognize that you don't have to leap off a cliff um, to try to try new things out. Um, a, I, would also, I would also say that although people may be resistant, most people do also get that meetings for the most part aren't very satisfactory. It's not that people think that the existing conventional formats are absolutely brilliant. So if they don't feel they're being personally challenged or attacked, I think most people would admit that we could do with a little experimentation. So I think there's usually room for maneuver. I think that's a really great point about not uh, jumping off the cliff. I mean, you don't have to reinvent everything all at once. You can reinvent little bits and pieces as you go and kind of test and see what the threshold of your group is. Yeah. Um, I think something also to, to bear in mind is that as meeting designers, we actually set the expectations for people when they walk into a room. Yeah. Um, so there are things that we can be doing with our room sets. Uh, you had mentioned people who are resistant. Um, uh, Jeff Hurt in our PYM Live San Francisco was talking about how he actually, in group activities, he lets the audience know that there's a space where they can go and opt out. Like if they're, because some people just like to work on their own, they don't like to be forced to talk to people like that. So, um, yeah, I thought that was a, a really interesting take on it, too. Um, well, I, think, I think that's a really, really good point. I mean, um, in other contexts, I take a, a, a much more playful approach to meetings. So this isn't, this isn't going to work for everyone, but I will, I, I will sometimes work with organizations where, um, for various reasons, they're willing to go far outside the conventional format and take a much more uh, playful and improvisational approach to meetings. So we'll introduce some fairly eccentric activities that, that some people call icebreakers, although I'm not sure that's the right term for it. And I think it's very important when you're doing that kind of thing to make it really clear to participants that this is an optional activity, and that if they want to um, opt out or just watch, um, that's absolutely fine. So that we're not forcing people in the name of change, we're not forcing people outside their comfort zone and putting them under just peer pressure to do something that they're not, they're not comfortable with. So, so I think that guy's bang on the money. You had mentioned that um, you know, part of the dysfunction of meetings is that we're creating these artificial constructs that are keeping people from communicating with each other. 
what are some ways that meeting planners can actually help facilitate communication, help people connect to each other as human beings? Um, uh, this is where my co-author Viv is, is really uh, passionate and I actually completely agree with her. She'd probably say two things. One is get rid of the tables. You want one thing to do that will probably do more than any single thing you can do to change the atmosphere in most corporate meeting spaces um, is, to, is to clear the tables out of the room. Um, as so often when I go to a corporate meeting, we go to an expensive hotel, to a room that's cost a lot of money. It tends to be a basement room with no daylight. Why that costs so much money, someone will have to explain to me. Um, and then they fill it with enormous tables, and frequently they put it in with tables that seat eight to ten people with a big white tablecloth over them. And when you're sitting at one of those, you can barely see your fellow participants in the room. You're, you're covered from waist level down. You're kind of blocking half the physical availability of people. And of course, you try having a conversation at those tables, it's almost impossible. The acoustic in the room means it's almost impossible to hear the person opposite you. When I'm at those kinds of events, I'm sort of nodding like a deaf person, pretending I can hear when I can't really, I just want the ordeal to be over. So the only people I can hear are the people either side of me. If I wanted to move, to go and find someone else to talk to, the room is cluttered with furniture. So if you took all of those tables out, suddenly you'd have a lot more breathing space in the room. People would see more of each other's bodies you would have much easier for people to take up their chairs and move about the space. You instantly create a much more dynamic and interesting space. Now, I recognize that even that will strike people as a really scary intervention uh, to make, <laughs> in which case my previous um, instruction applies. Try it for one session, try to try move some of the tables. But basically, I, th I think if I had one thing I would do to improve meetings in, in most Western countries, it would be just get rid of the tables. And, and the other thing would be longer breaks. I mean, we tend to think of breaks as being a bit of a goof-off time. Oh, yeah, well, we give the minimum necessary. We should, the real work happens in the room when we're listening to the CEO give that very important lecture. Uh, I think a lot of really good work happens in breaks. And if you give people long breaks, their brains recover, their level of engagement goes up. So I, I would say those are two of the simplest things you can do to create more humane and productive meetings. Those um, are and you don't, need a, you don't need a PhD to understand those ideas. <laughs> well, I know that uh, a lot of times I don't have my ideas fully formed or thought out until I'm having discussions with other people about what they think. And you know, yeah. a lot of times, if I just am sitting and listening to something, I might jot down a lot of notes and I might be thinking a lot of things. But unless I'm actually in conversation with someone, I don't know where to put that information. I don't know how to act on it. Yeah, Christy, that's that's a fantastic point. We, I think we, we kid ourselves that we're these very individual thinkers. I think we're much more profoundly social thinkers than we realize. We're very influenced by each other. Uh, and Nancy Dixon, I'll put a link up to it afterwards, wrote a really good blog post about a lot. Of, in order to understand, we do actually have to hear ourselves articulate ideas. That's actually a very significant way in which we process them. So if we just listen to someone talking, we're actually only able to use part of our brain. If we, if we listen and then go and talk to people about it, we're actually bringing much more of our intelligence to bear. So, so actually, th that conversational thing is actually really important to genuinely understanding new ideas. So it's not just you, it's, it's all of us, I think. Yeah, I think, and I, th I think people who, who consider themselves, you know, learners that need to question things or learners that need to hear things, I think we all need to be active to get things in our body to remember things. I think we all need to talk about the ideas to define what it is that we think about it and where we stand and how we would, how it fits into our own worldview or, or patterns or anything. Um, and, and, you know, as meeting planners, as Tim Sanders likes to say, you are the movie producers of the corporate world. We have the power to create transformative events. And, and, and mm -hmm. part of that transformation is that we are responsible for creating atmospheres in which people not only can gain knowledge, but to learn how to apply that knowledge so that when they leave, they're actually able to change patterns of behavior. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really great responsibility. <laughs> and, I, and I don't think that, that meeting designers get the credit for that. And I don't necessarily know that, that that is ultimately, I mean, if you look at it from a very, I mean, almost philosophical level, that's, that's what we do. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I sometimes think you know, if an organization changes meetings, it's going to change its culture. I mean, it, it actually happens in the way that it meets. And most organizations that are stuck are stuck in, in the way that they meet. But, you know, one of the things I get from, from studying improv theater is it, it really brings you constantly aware of how many possibilities there are moment by moment in any encounter with another human being. 
we tend to get stuck in routines where we think, oh, well, it's always like this, this person is always like that. And we miss that there's wiggle room. There's small changes that we can make moment by moment that can have a dramatic impact on all of our relationships. So, yeah, I think, I think meeting planners probably do sometimes feel stuck in a rut. They're usually in a job where uh, they're under a lot of pressure to get things right. So, so that mantra about openness to failure it doesn't seem to apply to meeting planners a lot of them. They're under pressure, you know, must get the biscuits delivered on time. People get freaked out if things aren't done right. But actually, they have the potential to make the most change. They do. And I, I think the improv uh, illusion is, is a really apt one. I know I also have an improv background. And, um, you know, the concept of saying yes as opposed to the, the you know, yes but or yes you know it's a yes and it's an exception you know you accept what's given to you looking at things as gifts even if they on the surface look challenging a lot of times some of our most creative meeting solutions come out of what look like roadblocks from venues yeah. or from situations um, I want to uh, to have you talk a little bit about international meetings and while you do that I'm going to be checking our comment stream to see if people are asking questions so sure. if you are viewing remotely, I just want to remind you that you can comment on the YouTube video, you can comment uh, on the Facebook page where I've embedded the link to view. You can also tag your tweets with Yay PYM, which is our, right here if you don't know how to spell the Yay PYM. So uh, we do have about eight minutes left in the broadcast, so I just want to make sure that you have a chance to ask any questions of Johnny uh, before we sign off. Um, so, Johnny, while I'm checking that, would you mind telling us a little bit about, you do a lot of meetings with multinational groups, um, and I think it's such a global economy. Uh, I know that, you know, Europe and the U.S. is in, in free trade talks. If that happens, those planners who don't currently have experience doing international meetings, that might open up more opportunities for them. Can so I'd love to hear from you what some of the, the challenges are with bringing multicultural groups together. Sure, sure. There was some, I think it was George Bernard Shaw, but some other smart guy who said, spoke about England and America being two cultures separated by a common tongue. Um, so one of the lessons I learned is a, a lot of the international meetings are moderated in English, but it's, it's easy to forget that for many people in the room at those meetings, that's not their first language. Um, and uh, in my experience, it's very easy for those people to get left out because they're really struggling to keep up not because they're stupid, but because this isn't their native tongue. Um, so we will often mess with, with meetings where we feel like using English is, is inhibiting people. And we've been known to use improv techniques like gibberish, which reset the room completely because we actually stop people using English and invite them to use a, a made-up language, means that they have to use other means of communicating, which can be very energizing. So on the one hand, I think, I think we, we underestimate the cultural differences. On the other, and I think as a flip to that, and paradoxically, um, if Viv and I had a pound for every time we show a technique to a group of people and some wise echo in the room says, ah, oh, yes, but that wouldn't work in, insert country here, culture here, region of the world here, level in the hierarchy, ah, oh, yeah, but that won't work with CEOs, no, that won't work in Singapore, ah, oh, yeah, but you can't do that in Saudi Arabia. Um, nine times out of ten, that's just, that's just not true. Um, I think the Australian term for that is a first thing. It's a myth. So although I think we do need to be sensitive to differences between countries, at the end of the day, I also think people are just people. And we need to be very careful not to rule out creative approaches based on myths about cultures not being open to working in certain ways. Our experience, and Viv and I do a lot of work with an aid organization, which means that we basically do get around a bit and work in some fairly far-flung parts of the world, and, uh, and we find that creative approaches work just as well in varied cultures. In fact, they thrive in more diverse environments. So what are some exercises or icebreakers, as it were, that meeting planners can, can build into the program to help kind of break the ice between people who don't share a common tongue? Um, I guess, I guess the caveat I would place with all these activities, and it goes back to your friend Jeff's comment earlier, is, is beware of just setting up a playful activity and assuming that everybody will join in. Make it, make it optional. Introduce it sensitively. Uh, I always feel a little bit wary about even calling it icebreakers, because that seems to carry the implication that there is ice, that there may not be. But uh, I do think energizing physical activities are good ways to create trust in a room. 
Um, there are hatfuls and hatfuls of these, and I, I, I think most facilitators probably have their favourite. So it's not, it's not for me to, to offer very strict guidance on it. Uh, I tell you what I have found tremendously helpful to me uh, in, in my work is is to find introductory activities where everyone in the room learns everyone's name um, and ignore the people who tell you that they already know because nine times out of ten they don't. Um, there is nothing more helpful to me as a facilitator than being pretty clued up about the names of the people in the room without having to squint at their badges. Now, okay, in a room of 300 people that's a lot, but in a room of 50 people it's not too much. And there are some great improv name games that you can play at the start, which means everybody in the room gets to know quite a lot more of the names of other people in the room. And there's nothing more conducive to getting on with people than being able to call them by their name. Uh, someone once said, there is no sweeter sound to man than the sound of his own name. And, and I know in my job, it makes a massive difference being able to do that. So when we're running these more international events, Viv and I, if we've got the time, we'll devote a lot of time to uh, good names at the start. And uh, yeah, another tip, kind of in that category with the tables is, is get rid of all those awful elaborate name badges which are cluttered with people's job titles and the logo of the company and pretty pictures and slogans about the conference. What I want is a badge, a really big one, with the person's first name on it in really big letters so I can see it at 100 yards. There's nothing more helpful to allowing people to form relationships than really good naming. And all that sort of scrambled egg, deputy head, CEO of Global Resources Brackets International, which we can't read anyway and probably don't care about, we could get rid of. So we will often get people to create their own name badges during the first break with the direction, use the name you want to be called by during this week and make it really big. Um, I think there are lots of really, really simple things like that that can do a lot to make our, um, our meetings more human. It's funny that you mentioned about the names because the first day of my improv class when I was learning at UCB was we stood in a circle and <clears throat> you had to repeat everybody's first, middle, and last name. And then you went all the way around the circle. And I'll never forget Aaron Rose Foley and Mike Garonzo Arouse. And like, it's really, it is so important. It's great that you mentioned um, the extra tips that you can make meetings more creative and productive, the name badges, removing the tables, um, offering longer breaks. Kiki Latalian uh, has to rush off for a focus group, but she did want to know, do you have any other simple little tweaks that meeting designers can make um, that will help people connect and, and, and kind of break down these artificial distinctions that we create uh, yeah. in the meeting process? I think one thing that, that I really like to do, and I don't always get the chance, is, is, is think about the food. Because we so often default to showing up at the hotel, it's the not very good coffee, the sticky buns for breakfast, which are really bad, sugar high, sugar high stuff, that's not good. Um, some of the best things I've done um, have been where we've created food together as a group. So, I mean, I remember doing a brain um, uh, sorry, uh, ideation workshop for an organization over three days. And at the end of the first day, in the evening, we did our own barbecue. The venue provided the food and the equipment, but we had a really strict instruction for the waiters to then back off and for us to have the experience of preparing and sharing food together. Um, and I think there's a lot that you can do with food. It's a very primal way for people to mix. And I, I think it's a shame that we usually create these strange, rather uncomfortable environments in professional venues where un anonymous wait staff, who we know aren't being paid very well, have to sort of serve us with food. And I think there's a lot of potential in there to create much more playful and engaging ways of meeting over food. Again, going back to our much more, more primal history. So ways to play with food, I think, is another way to make meetings much more human and get away from, I think, routines that we take for granted but that aren't actually really very good for us. Yeah, I know I've seen at meetings where you show up for lunch and there's uh, on the little menu that tells you what you're eating, it gives you instructions on how to assemble it and they have a lazy Susan so you have to work together to get all everything that you need and you know, another thing people do at lunches uh, is always cram a, a speaker in it, and I think that that kind of defeats the purpose of that meal break, which is to connect with other people and to network. Um, I think another thing people do to sabotage that kind of connection is to dim the lights so that people can't see each other. No, uh, <laughs> absolutely. No, and I'm glad you mentioned that because lighting is like. You know, and that, that's the terrible thing about the tendency to PowerPoint. It's bad enough that we've got presentations anyway and we have to listen, but that usually is an excuse to dim the lights in the room and draw the curtains and 
and keep the daylight out. And again, it's dead simple. This isn't rocket science. Let's just have some daylight in the room so that people can actually see each other. Um, there's, a, there's another, those are the kind of simple things that I think that, that can, can transform a lot of the meetings that I've gone to. They've been changed a lot by just simple things like that. Yeah, and, and also too, you know, if the purpose, you know, it goes back to the goals. What's, what's the goal of this particular part of the meeting? If it's to help people connect and to meet new people, if it's like the opening reception, why have like some kind of R&B band that drowns out any kind of conversation someone can have for three hours? Um, so, interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, you wrote a book called Creative Facilitation. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that book and, and the audience that it serves? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I wrote it with my uh, friend and collaborator, Viv McWaters. She lives on the other side of the planet most of the time. She's in Melbourne, Australia. I'm here in the UK, in Cambridge. But we seem to have created lots of opportunities to work together. And um, we were going to do a week's training and decided to produce a kind of guidebook for the participants. So it started life, this book, as a kind of a manual for facilitators. Um, and having given it a trial run, we thought, well, actually, why don't we pinch this off and pretty it up a bit and make it nicely designed. And it's, it's essentially 75 pages of hints and tips based on our collective, I don't know how many, lots and lots of experiences of working with all sorts of groups. Uh, and, and we try to write it so that it's not one of these rather intimidating books about facilitation. There are some books about facilitation, I look at them and I, I start to feel incompetent when I read them. They say, oh gosh, this sounds very complicated. Oh, I do all this contracting and all these things to make it, you know, we wanted to write a book that was very user friendly, uh, quite reasonable to look at, um, fairly anecdotal, easy to access, um, to provide some inspiration to people. Um, and, and that's really why we wrote it. I know reading the book, what really struck me was how similar the worlds of theater performance, film, and meeting design are. And, um, and I, I, I really, I, I, I did, I found it very easy to, to digest. I think it's a, a really interesting read for anybody who uh, is curious about becoming a meeting facilitator as well as meeting designers who are interested in perhaps working with one and understanding how that process is. Um, we are, we've reached the end of our time. Um, I wanted to thank you for joining us. I wanted to thank Kiki and Tahira and Planner Meetings and Terry Bemis and Mean Me and LP and King and Prince and Angela Schlepp and everybody who's been sharing the information or commenting on it during this broadcast. If you have questions uh, for Johnny uh, after this is over, if you're watching this on demand, you can still tweet at YayPYM. Um, you can still comment on the video, and we will be answering those questions as we can get to them as soon as possible. Um, Johnny, will you let people know how they can get in touch with you personally or where they can read more about you or about the book or find it? Uh, sure. Um, uh, tweet, if you're into Twitter, um, I respond to tweets. Um, here is, um, ooh, let's try to get my finger to point to somewhere at the bottom of the screen there. It says at Johnny Moore. That's my Twitter name. If you go to creativefacilitation.com, you'll find uh, my contact details there. Uh, also, that's where you get the book. Um, it's a free download, so um, you can take it in PDF or Amazon Kindle or other ebook formats. Um, so help yourselves. The book's free. Um, it's designed to be uh, spread and enjoyed by your colleagues. Um, so that's the place to get hold of them. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, virtual viewers, for joining us today. This is one of what we hope are going to be many chats with um, people that we find really interesting doing very innovative things in the meetings realm. So if you have suggestions of people that you would like to see profiled or interviewed, definitely tweet them to at PYMLive or comment on the Planning Meetings Facebook page or on this video. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed your time with us as much as I enjoyed my time speaking with Johnny. And plan well and prosper, friends. Until next time. Thanks, Christy.